you very much for this welcome and good morning, Your Royal Highness, uh, Minister, uh, Mayor of Oslo, all participants, fellow youth workers, outreach workers, as I would like to call you. It is a great honor indeed to have the opportunity to address you. Uh, I am very grateful uh, for the invitation to such an event because it gives me an opportunity to share my thoughts, which are normally restricted to the mainstream of social work, to share with you those thoughts in fields which I think have uh, not a marginal, but a very central role for social work in general and for the development of social work. And the significance of the work that you are engaged in has very well been captured by the opening words, uh, and it is very rare that a conference is being opened formally already with such fitting reference to the essence of outreach work. And I would like to uh, thank Your Royal Highness particularly for the example that you've given. Uh, it is in a way a summary of what I'd like to say, that it is a matter of recognizing the capacities of young people rather than treating them as a mere problem. And I think that should set the scene. And I. Uh, link that immediately with the theme of that conference, which I think is very well chosen. It is about empowering marginalized youth, and it is about being able to read what presents itself, what messages are being conveyed in the troublesome lives of the people that you meet in the streets and that you're trying to bring in from the margin and give them a role that is fitting to them as the future citizens of our society. So, to give a brief introduction to what I'm uh, trying to say is that outreach work has two directions in which it takes. It is on the one hand about mediating people's, young people's place and role in society, so that it's reaching out to them and seeing how they can be brought in uh, into the, the life and the uh, workings of society. But it is at the same time also making society aware what is going on, not just amongst those marginalized young people, but what their troubles mean in terms of being indicators for what is happening in society generally. And I think this dual role is very important to uphold, and it is a role that uh, uh, links immediately with the social policy making in our society, with an understanding of where the difficulties are not just the difficulties of those young people, but are something that all of us in society have to deal with. So youth is not a chronological entity that is defined by belonging to a certain age group. Youth is a complex range of constructs uh, in which psychological indicators play an equally important and ever diminishing role uh, that as social indicators are coming into play as well. If we just take a very simple indicator that the onset of puberty uh, by the year 2000 has reached uh, a five-year lower threshold than it was in the year 1800, and that means that the age range which actually covers youth and adolescence particularly is constantly being widened. Commercial pressures mean that young people at a very early age are being drawn into adult concerns, into adult decision-making as well, take part as consumers in affairs that uh, even recently were considered to be the reserve of the adult community. And at the same time, at the higher level, youth extends almost indefinitely into adulthood uh, as the uh, school age has been put up in most countries as entry into adult life with the two key indicators, entering into stable work relations and entering into stable 
personal relationships, marriage or other uh, personal relationships, all is being postponed uh, forcibly, particularly in the area of uh, employment, with alarming rates of youth unemployment in all parts of Europe, particularly in my country, in Italy, but other southern European countries, where it has reached 40%, and that really uh, spells an enormous burden, uh, not just on the young people, but on the integration of society in generally. Later marriage uh, uh, rates are also indicative of this long moratorium that we are uh, creating, that society is creating for young people. And whilst it might be quite nice uh, that we see phenomena like uh, a parent generation that goes back perhaps to the 1968 generation sharing the same music tastes, for instance, for the Beatles with young people, it also means that the boundaries in our society between youth and adult life are merging, are becoming fluid, and that has a uh, disoriented as well as uh, uh, a reaching out uh, effect on the relationship in society. So the fluidity of boundaries links immediately with the fluidity of identity boundaries. And we can see that young people are most directly affected by the changes uh, in identity reference points in our society. If I can just pick out a few key indicators which we can observe in all European countries. There is, of course, first of all, the demographic change. The uh, aging population means that uh, young people are finding themselves ever more in a minority uh, in our society. Uh, very clearly expressed, for instance, in terms of political representation, that the weight of the voice of young people uh, is, uh, as it were, less important uh, quantitatively uh, as that of older people as they participate, at least as voters, in society uh, in much larger proportions. And at the same time, the uh, uh, birth rate is falling, and so uh, young people have also got less of an opportunity to meet young people. When I talk to my students, uh, I'm often surprised that uh, very few of them actually have direct experience now in meeting young people, meeting children, knowing how a three-year-old reacts, plays, uh, what interests a five-year-old has, because they grow up uh, with very few young people around them. And of course, the third demographic change in terms of uh, patchwork families, the uh, uh, fluidity also of personal relationships means that a sense of belonging uh, as the key indicator, as the key arena in which identities form uh, is uh, becoming often very confusing and the uh, uh, stability of where to belong is no longer structured and patterned by uh, these kind of traditional indicators. We have a second uh, dimension of uh, continuous changes at the cultural level. We find uh, particularly young people participating in a global culture much more readily, obviously through uh, the communication means that are open to them. They can orient their style of living and search for reference points of identity from information, from communities, social networks, from all over the world. And at the same time, uh, there is a growing phenomenon of young people again forming, and not just young people, forming tribal relationships. If you just look at the labels that uh, are important in clothing, that that substitutes, in a way, a sense of belonging, that you belong to this or that label in fashion uh, is, for young people, often very important uh, and spells a kind of a, a tension between a global merging of tastes and yet a regrouping and also a kind of colonial aspect that comes into it 
because obviously behind those labels lie again commercial interests which young people are often not really capable of uh, facing up to and uh, uh, parents amongst you will know uh, how important it is for young people to buy this kind of tennis or sport shoes as against another label and that confronts particularly poor people again with enormous pressures to keep up with the kind of reference points and changes that uh, expressed in those kind of allegiances. And then of course migration, but migration not as the kind of the big issue as it is normally being portrayed, but migration as part of this differentiation, diversification of cultural lifestyles in a way in which Europe again is catching up with a situation that is not unknown in Europe, but that characterized the whole history of Europe, but is obviously gaining significance in terms of that tension that also represents and reflects in attitudes and political attitudes uh, at the adult level, where uh, the uh, search for reference points, for identities, for a sense of belonging has become very important. And then the electronic revolution that I already referred to, uh, the ability to communicate and also to physically uh, move uh, between different spheres of uh, society and uh, global society uh, is the reference point there, uh, confronts young people with completely new sets of potential relationships, potential also expressions of their identity. Uh, what we can see, for instance, through the knowledge that is being uh, distributed and disseminated in the internet is that a sense of authority is disappearing, that all information confronts young people in an unstructured way that where before you looked at a, a dictionary or at uh, uh, an encyclopedia that was selected by people who had authority to uh, privilege certain forms of knowledge. Now information comes in a totally unstructured way and a sense of uh, disorientation is as it were built into this kind of electronic revolution. And I would like to bring that also in line with the new power assertions that become available through the media, that it's not just a matter of being able to participate in social networks, as it were, democratically, but also exploiting those new media, for instance, for the purpose of mobbing. And most of you will be aware of what problem that represents when young people use the media in order to gang up against particular members of uh, their youth group or uh, unknown members sometimes and use the power that lies in this new boundary crossing and authority challenging that goes with the uh, uh, electronic revolution. And finally, uh, the political changes have to be uh, mentioned here as well, that politics is becoming equally unstructured, global in one sense, but also disoriented that the old uh, reference points of left and right in politics play far less important roles as against populism that uh, looks at short-term issues, single issue politics are dominating in most uh, European countries, new parties springing up, particularly again in the country where I live in Italy, we have the Grillini, a movement that exists by uh, uh, propaganda uh, being communicated largely in uh, social networks where the main leader of that movement uh, does not even give interviews but only communicates through blogs, has no role in parliament itself but steals the whole movement as it were through the internet. That's a completely new form, a new uh, fluidity that is being introduced in politics as well. The end of ideological positions, single issue politics, all that amounts to a, a huge change in, as it were, a uh, horizon against which identities 
also in terms of political allegiances that young people uh, should be introduced to uh, means and uh, makes the task of finding entry points into a uh, political commitment by young people particularly difficult. Uh, on the one hand opens opportunities, but on the other hand uh, becomes also a great challenge and requires competences that many young people do not possess by themselves. But that's where the challenge for our type of work actually arises. I would like to emphasize that all that uh, is uh, having an impact on the self-perception of young people. And uh, youth is particularly the age in which the self has always been and is for psychological reason the center of uh, attention and uh, the center of developments. But what we see here is precisely as a reflection of the changes and transformation processes that I mentioned, the future horizon, uh, which was always a kind of uh, incentive for young people to uh, aspire to, is becoming also limited to immediate concerns. Young people do not dare to think in long-term projects anymore because their life has become so precarious. There is nothing that you can predict, that you can aspire to in the longer term. Uh, the unpre uh, uh, unpredictability is, as it were, built into particularly the economic system where flexibility is now a key word for preparation for careers. In other words, not the engagement in a particular uh, line of training, but the openness towards changes as they happen. Uh, individualism links also to those kind of uh, commercial and uh, economic interests that young people and all of us are compelled to make something of ourselves, uh, to become uh, somebody. And the message that is being given thereby is that you have to make something of yourself. It's not, as it were, a uh, given pattern into which you can uh, uh, grow into, uh, and that is uh, given to you or that you can take position towards, but that the emphasis lies and the responsibility lies with the person. And again here, the uh, well-known tendency to project yourself as an individual also through the social media uh, is indicative of those kind of developments. I've only recently become aware of the meaning of the strange word selfie, uh, that the uh, portrait that you give of yourself and your physical appearance uh, is gaining such importance for young people that you are yourself by what you present of yourself, not what you are in a given context. The contextless self that presents itself here is an enormous change and an enormous challenge also in terms of the, uh, the psychological preparation for the demands that are being made on young people. And a further indicator of how different the approaches to selfhood and to identity have become is that in all that fluidity, we recognize also a surge uh, and an, a fascination with something tangible, with something that is permanent. And I recognize in the uh, uh, obsession uh, at times with bodily characteristics, with tattoos and piercing, a desire to leave something that is permanent when everything around you has become unpredictable. There is something that is part of you that you can actually uh, hold on to, uh, even though it might be uh, embarrassing later on in life, as I always predict, uh, for those young people who have eternalized their current state of selfness, 
throughout their life, but uh, that's a matter for future, uh, uh, not youth workers, but senior workers probably uh, to deal with there. Uh, at the same time, also the body, and that is again part of this fundamental ambiguity and contradictiveness, the body itself has become something plus, uh, that represents plasticity, that you can transform, not just in terms of sex changes, but also of enhancements. Uh, if breast enhancements, for instance, become now a birthday present to teenagers by their parents, where have we ended in terms of the messages that that gives to young people? And again, in terms of the enormous discrepancy between the technical feasibility on the one hand and the choices that you have, not being born into a gender, not being born into a particular physical appearance, but having the choice to make something else of it, and the emotional competences that are required to actually cope with that responsibility. That discrepancy is putting enormous strain on young people and uh, leaves young people often stranded in a desperate loneliness and in a desperate isolation with regards to those uh, uh, choices and those responsibilities. And what I mean, therefore, uh, to sum up this ambiguity is that we are faced with, and uh, your work will immediately testify to that, with a widening, what I would call, opportunity gap that on the one hand, we see the expansion of personal autonomy, freedom from former uh, restrictions in terms of place, in terms of identity, in terms of roles, gender roles particularly, are opening up, are being challenged. Uh, people with disabilities, for instance, can also make something of themselves. So there are enormous opportunities, easier travel, easier communication, and so on. And at the same time, the discrepancy in realizing this autonomy that is, of course, linked to having the material resources to participate in those choices. And it's all very well to have a choice, but if you don't have the money for it, if you do not have the resources uh, to participate in that choosing, it becomes extremely uh, divisive. The cognitive resources, are young people uh, capable of exercising those uh, choices? The flood of information that I've already mentioned, uh, the uh, offers that come in such an unstructured way, make cognitive demands for which, again, a particular kind of uh, uh, preparation would be required. To speak nothing of the emotional resources that are required, uh, the exploration of alternative relations obviously are part uh, uh, of our psychological equipment and need to take place in adolescence. But I think one of the most important resources in terms of emotional resources is that you can only exercise these choices and this branching out into other possibilities on the basis of having experienced a secure attachment in early childhood. And again, whilst we in social work know that uh, many people have not experienced that, catching up on uh, a secure bonding is a key reference point for social work in all contexts, and therefore has to be uh, uh, addressed anew and needs to gain new importance precisely in the face of these enormous uh, changes that uh, have to be made. If we just look in terms of uh, what it means in the new social networks to establish friendships and to count somebody as a friend uh, on a uh, very uh, simple, formal uh, attachment through internet contacts or through following up real contacts on the internet, but what it means, for instance, to end a friendship in real terms, you went through a process of grieving if you lost a friend. In a social network, it's a mouse click and that person is gone. What are the emotional implications of that? How do we cope? How do young people cope with 
these kind of opportunities and the kind of challenges that uh, are uh, facing them in that regard. So, what are the symptoms that uh, result from those kind of uh, social transformation processes? And let me emphasize, these social transformation processes are not natural phenomena. They are uh, political and commercial interests that manifest themselves as choices that society makes to go in a particular direction. I would like to summarize that with the phenomenon of a decision overload that young people are faced with. One reaction by many young people is the reaction of withdrawal, uh, that they uh, withdraw not just in terms of their lifestyle to their computer console somewhere in an isolated room where not even their family members might be able to reach them other than by shoving the meals uh, through their doors, but also in terms of an emotional withdrawal, the phenomenon of depressive symptoms is growing amongst young people and needs to be taken very seriously, not just as a psychological phenomenon, but also as a social indicator. We see on the opposite side uh, an increase of what is termed acting out behavior, uh, everything from bullying, mobbing, but also uh, the famous uh, uh, and much discussed attention deficit and hyperactivity syndrome, which I think is again not just a psychiatric indicator and uh, linked to certain uh, neurological processes, but links directly with the kind of overload of choices, overload of uh, opportunities and attention-seeking opportunities uh, that are being presented to young people. Then, as I already uh, said, the uh, overload with decisions uh, to make something of yourself, whether that is intellectually or physically, is uh, trapping young people in a, a kind of over-competitiveness which also manifests itself often in aggressiveness, and aggressiveness, again, in uh, economic terms, is often praised as a prerequisite for being successful uh, in uh, your career. And finally, the search for what we can call given structures, for uh, renouncing the relativity of a multicultural society and withdrawing onto something that apparently is very simple, is simply given, has something to do with either genetics or history, nationalism, racism, are attractive alternatives to young people in the face of this overload. And uh, we have obviously in this city and in this country to remember that no European country, unfortunately, is immune against those kind of tendencies. And uh, we remember uh, with uh, uh, great uh, emotion, I think, uh, what this country has suffered recently uh, in this regard. But it also goes into this, the furthest corners of Europe. I live in a little village uh, on a thousand meters uh, with 300 people and uh, last year I went uh, for an evening walk uh, or I drove up to a car park with my car and my car still has a German uh, number plate and there was a, a group of young people in a corner of this tiny little mountain road uh, drinking beer and as they saw my German uh, number plate they saluted me with a Hitler uh, salute. Uh, I was absolutely shocked that in the kind of idyllic circumstances of my mountain region, those kind of sentiments are there. These young people meet in the face of uh, uh, cultural uh, diversity with withdrawing into these kind of uh, uh, given security uh, promising boundaries. But we also have to see that uh, uh, mafia-type involvements, uh, some of you uh, uh, will have seen the film uh, Gomorra, uh, filmed again in Italy, but symptomatic not just of Italy, I know the situation from my work uh, in Ireland as well, that terrorist groups recruit young people into their uh, ambience by promising not just 
a, a political allegiance, but also an identity, a future, a lifestyle, and that becomes an alternative for the insecurities that the official political scene and the official economic scene is also offering. Mafia-type organizations are the biggest threat, I think, to our political and social stability, not just in the traditional uh, mafios countries. Uh, we will see those kind of phenomena spread uh, to other parts of uh, Europe as well. And as I said, uh, alternative economies, uh, street children economies, as I would call them, are not just a phenomenon of uh, developing uh, countries, but we see that young people are uh, driven into alternative economic and therefore criminalized lifestyles uh, where they self-organize, not just for economic gains, but also for recreating a sense of belonging. And obviously, this is a field where all of you are experts. So, what is outreach work? Uh, all about in the face of this uh, very anecdotal overview of current social changes. For me, outreach work is, uh, has a central role in what I would call getting the message. What lies behind these kinds of behaviors that young people present, not in terms of individual pathologies, but as indicators of what is happening in our society. And therefore, uh, what is the role of outreach work is to present this kind of comprehensive awareness of change processes that affect all of society and not only young people. Outreach work has the role of analyzing uh, the, uh, and distinguishing the positive sides and the dangerous aspects of those kind of spontaneous reactions that young people present precisely in these kind of unstructured environments outside the school, outside uh, the orderly neighborhoods, wherever they might still exist, and recognizing what are the opportunities and what are the dangers that contribute to further splits in our society and further the segregation. And I think outreach work, therefore, needs to start with not just with the other person, but with oneself. Where is my own place in this society? Where do I stand with regards to those kind of changes? And do I have a position? Do I have the competences to confront them? Because, as you all know, young people are extremely perceptive of insecurities in the adult people that they meet. And if there is insecurity, that shows and uh, that makes a difference to have worked through those kind of uh, uh, dilemmas and issues beforehand. So what is the function, uh, what are the functions of outreach work uh, given these kind of uh, global changes? Well, first of all, I see in outreach work a kind of a early warning system not just in terms of the symptoms presented by young people in difficulties, but it is an opportunity for society to monitor what goes on in society generally as seen through the eyes and uh, reflected in the behavior of young people. And I uh, am very aware of how uh, the social system in this country and in the city of Oslo is emphasizing uh, the importance of having this monitoring system available as part of their being in touch, not just with young people, but uh, with what is happening in society generally. Uh, and I think that's a very wise investment uh, to maintain. It is then directed at the young people uh, and in a way that is always aimed at reconnecting young people to decision-making institutions and processes in society and decision-making bodies rather than uh, isolating them in the milieus and in the contexts in which they uh, are already uh, engaged in. Uh, it means a uh, low-key response but low-key responses are not 
uh, therefore less skilled responses. And uh, I think this is an area, and I'm very pleased that so much research uh, will be presented at this conference. This is an area where all of social work has to learn that uh, uh, not just the heavy or the elaborate uh, uh, therapeutic or therapy-like uh, interventions are the areas of high skills, but it's this uh, careful listening, it's getting in touch uh, without intruding on young people that is a very important skill. Avoidance of labeling, uh, sustaining periods of inaction, of just being around, uh, is an enormously valuable uh, skill. Providing role models that links to the ability to have your own stability, uh, I think, uh, with all the liberal aversion to not adopting uh, uh, authoritative roles that I think all of us share, uh, we need to go beyond this kind of scepticism against all authority and ask ourselves, are there positive elements in uh, assuming responsibility, in taking a position, in defending a particular uh, uh, view on society? Uh, uh, and that, I think, is what young people also need uh, to have a partner who is not just infinitely uh, uh, understanding and, and relativizes everything, but uh, is somebody that you can also argue with, that you can fight with, uh, that sets limits uh, to the views that are handling in, uh, that are current in society. Handling crisis and, as I would call it also, uh, positive risk-taking, is a, a very important aspect of uh, outreach work, mediating, as it were, uh, between different value systems, being able to uh, go beyond the textbooks, uh, competences and prescriptions that uh, uh, ha uh, characterize social work. Outreach work is crisis work, and crisis work requires a lot of creativity uh, and not distinguishing, as it were, what is becoming so prevalent again today, distinguishing between promising cases and leaving the hopeless cases behind, but it is precisely bringing a new perspective, a changed perspective, to bear on uh, uh, those kind of situations that you meet. So, to finish with, I just want to uh, present you uh, a couple of methodological indicators that I think characterize uh, outreach work uh, very centrally and should perhaps give uh, reference points for our discussion through this conference. It's very difficult to summarize those kind of methodological principles in a simple phrase. That's why I've chosen uh, something a bit more uh, uh, elaborate and rhetorical, but uh, I think that is appropriate for the context in which you work. Because on the one hand, all your work involves respecting the privacy and the individuality, the old uh, motto of self determination by young people, combining that at the same time with what I would call uh, the pedagogical courage, not just to leave people to their own worlds, to their own types of behavior, but to engage with that, engage with that in a pedagogical sense, and to uh, challenge the adjustment and uh, adaptation processes that we see already in operation. Isolation that young people might choose is a way of showing your capacity to cope with those impending uh, challenges and demands made on them, but to offer also those people who choose to withdraw uh, an opportunity to rethink that and to uh, consider alternatives is equally important as doing the same kind of challenging with young people that have, as it were, an acting out uh, mode of confronting the challenges and dealing with them. Uh, but in all of that, I think it is very important to see 
the existing capacities, the coping potential, and not the problematic element uh, in this kind of behavior. Reaching out to young people means uh, learning to read the signs for what they are trying to express, what meaning they are giving to their behavior, uh, even though it might come out in a very distorted, in a very uh, provocative, in a very uh, uh, dismissive way in terms of the values uh, of our society. So looking at the existing uh, capacities, especially in problematic young people, uh, because in that problematic behavior, an awareness of the conflicting demands made on young people there uh, is being expressed. Young people cope with the contradictions that surround them by also showing contradictory behavior. And that is not an excuse uh, uh, for uh, co uh, 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 consenting with that behavior, excusing that kind of behavior, but it's the entry point uh, of making contact and uh, therefore uh, is an essential skill in outreach work. S furthering the sense of authorship is directly linked with that. Uh, young people are not victims of circumstances. With all the explanations that we might have that uh, show where the problems might have their origins, it doesn't help young people to simply portray them as the products of those circumstances. They are the authors, they are keenly aware and longing for being recognized as uh, acting uh, human beings, as a source of agency, of creativity, uh, and particularly professionalized services have to be very aware of the danger of what we can call professional victimization of young people with all the good intentions that might uh, go with that. That means also seeing within those attempts to be active, to present yourself, not just a private expression, not just a playground expression of forming new social relationships, but we need to go further than that and see what young people need and what all of society needs is, as I would call it, a new social contract. is an ability to express your participation in society in terms of citizenship. And citizenship is not something that you acquire by having a passport, but is by way of having a stake, being a, a stakeholder in a society. Uh, having access to resources, but also exercising your rights in all that. The conjunction between rights and resources is something that I think is being concretely negotiated in the kind of context uh, in which you work and in which you show your skills. Uh, that means rights are not just presents, are not just gifts, uh, but uh, come immediately linked with obligations uh, uh, and uh, therefore take place and shape themselves in terms of the boundaries that uh, need to accompany the work on boundaries and on those kind of changes. So to sum up, the dual role of outreach work with which I started is on the one hand that it signals to young people that they are not alone in their search for identities, in their search for securities, for future perspectives, but that that is a concern that they share with other representatives of society, with the adult society, uh, and that there are people who are prepared to recognize their searches, their often inappropriate attempts of participating in their own future creation uh, uh, in uh, uh, an acknowledging way, in a way that encourages them and gives the message that young people matter. Therefore, the way of reaching out to them uh, does, not, uh, does not need to present itself as a way of intrusion or of control, 
but of a way of trying to understand what is it that young people want to express through their behavior. But at the same time, the other side of outreach work is participating in the policy making uh, structures and organizations of our society, that that message is being heard in the right places, that decisions are being made in the, f in the light of all those changes that society is facing that uh, are to the benefit not just of marginalized uh, young people, but that have a benefit for society overall. Because we can see in young people a kind of a seismograph of social change what it means and what it signals to society. And society uh, often finds it so uncomfortable and marginalizes young people because it does not want to face up to the kind of issues that uh, are being created, not on the margins, but in the center uh, of our societies. So outreach workers are a kind of interpreter between different worlds and different priorities. So a globalizing world requires, I think, new securities. And that means not a return to the old securities that have dominated even our uh, social policy systems and our welfare state arrangements. There are changes necessary, and we are in the midst of those changes. And the observations that you make and the engagement that you have and the opportunities that you have in reading the signs of the time are an important contribution towards managing those changes and managing also a transformative way of understanding the role of social work, not just in the areas of outreach and youth work, but also in the center of social work. We need a new approach to what it means to be a professional. We need a new approach to our methodology and an approach that takes those kind of criteria uh, into consideration. And this uh, sets the scene uh, that we need to go beyond just technical competences of having better skills, having better answers to the problems, but of raising questions in a new way and sharing those questions with the people that are the users and the collaborators in those processes of change. With that, I wish all of us a very fruitful discussion in what follows in those two days. And thank you again for the invitation. <laughs>